So, welcome those who are joining us on the recording, which we will upload uh, over the next 48 hours or so. Okay, it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Gladstone Professor of Government and Fellow of All Souls at Oxford, Stathis Kalavas is one of the most prominent Greeks working in the UK today. He has had and continues to have a hugely distinguished career with professorships at Ohio State, New York, Chicago and Yale universities in the States before he came to England. He's published extensively in Greek and English on his uh, specialist discipline on political violence and on broader Greek history and politics, not least on the Greek Civil War. His work is, if I may say so, as a non-expert, distinguished for its clarity of thought, its cogency and its sound good reason. Professor Calaves was last year's Runciman lecturer at King's College London, and it's a great pleasure and privilege to have him here with us tonight. He's going to tell us why the Greek Revolution still matters today. Professor Calavas, over to you. Thank you very much, John. It's a great uh, privilege and honor to be uh, with you tonight uh, to share some thoughts about um, the lasting importance uh, of the Greek Revolution and War of Independence. And I'm going to uh, share a few slides uh, that are going to help me go through this uh, lecture. And here they are, and I hope um, they're visible to everyone. Um, so why does the Greek Revolution of 1821, as we call it, still matters, uh, is the question uh, I'm going to ask. And I'm going to argue there are three uh, bundles of reasons it does. Uh, some more obvious and some less obvious. The first uh, bundle of reason has to do with uh, Greek history. The second one has to do with history uh, as such. And the third one with the qualities of the Greek revolution as a story, as an enduring story at that. So let me start with the most obvious point for every Greek or for every person uh, who is interested in the history of modern Greece, the Greek revolution matters and milestones matter. Uh, the second century uh, anniversary of its uh, eruption in 1821 is an occasion to reflect, uh, to ask questions, uh, to have public debates. And I have to say that uh, despite the pandemic, which um, minimized the extent to which public events could be um, held in Greece to celebrate those events. Uh, we've been uh, witness to um, a lot of um, very important conferences, uh, some spectacular uh, museum exhibitions uh, in Athens, which I very much recommend uh, to every visitor, but also to a slew of uh, new publications that have renewed uh, interest uh, of historians uh, and other scholars uh, to that event. Uh, and because reflection and investigation are never just about the past, but also primarily about the present and perhaps even about the future, uh, this is a unique opportunity to think about how um, the past of modern Greece connects with its, its present and its future in novel ways. Um, and some of the things that I'm going to say today point in that direction. Uh, we've been uh, very privileged to have um, excellent new books either just published or coming to publication and a very, very interesting debate going on. The second uh, bundle of reasons why I think the uh, Greek Revolution has an interesting uh, and um, relevant meaning today has to do with how we think about history. And I'm going to mention uh, four uh, reasons for why I think this specific event matters today. The first has to do with the processes of global transitions. The second, with processes of revolutions. The third one with humanitarian intervention. And uh, the fourth one with what I describe as the riddle of two-way causation. I'm going to explicate all of these things very briefly, but I think I'm going to try to make an effort to be also very clear. Global transition, uh, we very often ask ourselves 
whether we live in a time of global transition, it's not very easy to say so. It always seems that things are changing, but whether things are changing in a momentous and secular way is never clear. Now, the Greek revolution is very interesting because as this uh, chart, which is not very clear on my um, uh, PowerPoint uh, uh, suggests, it was uh, a first uh, of a series of global events that were to change the way uh, the politics uh, uh, of the globe um, are conducted. What this chart indicates is the, uh, the change, uh, the shadow area on the bottom uh, of the graph shows the number of uh, the, the extent of territory that is ruled by empires uh, and what comes uh, to the right, uh, the territory ruled by nation states. And as you can see, uh, around the beginning of the 20th century, We've, had, we've reached the tipping point, especially after the, the end of the First World War, when nation states became the dominant form of government. Uh, and today they are the exclusive, almost exclusive form of government. That was not the case in the 1820s. And uh, the Greek War of Independence being a war of national liberation and creation of nation state was in fact one of those events uh, that uh, announced this kind of momentous global change before it took place. One of those things we look uh, in retrospect to understand how things change. Uh, the canary in the mind, uh, if I may use this kind of metaphor, uh, uh, no matter how you think about this change, it's a change that really has defined our times. Now, it's very difficult, as I mentioned, to know while we're living whether anything we observe has that characteristic, but it's fascinating to go back into uh, the history of the Greek uh, War of Independence and, and see that element. The second uh, element is related to it and has to do with uh, uh, the idea of revolutions. And what I find very interesting in the history of the Greek Revolution is it combines uh, and contrasts two competing legacies, uh, two competing revolutionary legacies. One has to do with the emergence of what may be described as radical liberalism, the a set of ideas, a set of perceptions and worldviews uh, that emerged and became dominant with the French Revolution, uh, and which were very present during the Greek Revolution, especially in its constitutional history, in its discourse, in the way it appealed uh, to European peoples. And the second one has to do uh, with nationalism, the creation of nation states that I just mentioned, uh, which is very much uh, associated with the American revolutions, uh, the American and Latin American revolutions, which in a sense created new states out of existing empires. The difference here, which I think is very interesting, is that the Greeks did not revolt against a colonial or a settler empire, but against uh, an empire of uh, an older sort, uh, and, uh, and that was the Ottoman Empire. So it, we can say that the Greek nation state is uh, a post-imperial, uh, state, but it shares a lot of similarities with post-colonial states, and therefore uh, we can think of uh, modern Greek history as also being um, a first, um, uh, giving us a first sense of how post-colonial um, uh, states emerged, uh, especially uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. The third uh, dimension has to do with the way in which the Greek War of Independence was resolved, and it was resolved through a process that today we would describe as humanitarian intervention. It was an intervention by the great powers, uh, which was uh, meant to uh, promote their own competing interests against each other, but also uh, it was couched and understood uh, in ways that have very many similar elements with today's humanitarian interventions. And I have two uh, on, on this slide, two excellent books by historians who are not specialists uh, or even experts on modern Greece who make precisely these points, making the argument that what we call humanitarian intervention today, which has become extremely common, originates uh, to a very large extent uh, in the politics of uh, uh, the Greek War of Independence. Lastly, uh, a more theoretical point, but I think a very um, fascinating and interesting one has to do with what I describe as the riddle of uh, two-way causation. Very often the way we look at the past is characterized by a linear, a seamless and, and, and very chronologically based understanding of causes and effects in which the causes always precede the effects. Uh, however, uh, that assumes that the actors uh, who participate in these processes are constant. 
from the beginning the process through the present. And very often what happens is we project back into the past uh, precisely uh, those actors. Uh, and therefore we ignore how cause and effect are much more intertwined and not as linear as we would like to think. And I'm going to illustrate that with a very simple example uh, for about the formation of the Greek nation, which is both the cause uh, of the Greek revolution, but also its effect. Uh, the national narrative, um, the standard history uh, of the Greek uh, revolution goes a bit like that. Uh, the Greek nation is suppressed with the collapse of the Byzantine empire uh, Greece is occupied. The term that we use in Greece to refer to that period is the Turkish occupation. And then in 1821, the Greek nation wakes up from slumber, rises up, and in 1832, it achieves uh, officially sovereignty and independence and forms the modern Greek state. So that's the national narrative in which we can see a seamless process in which the nation, the Greek nation, is the actor, the constant actor through time. Uh, historians and other scholars who study this process have uh, raised a, a number of concerns about it, but it remains a very popular understanding of Greek history. This is a detail from a popular painting in the city of Naflio and that depicts this uh, seamless, continuous uh, story uh, of modern Greece as a story of the Greek people um, in a sort of seamless way. You can see Byzantine emperors, uh, you can see uh, the church, you can see uh, the fighters of Greek independence, and you can also see the, the fighters of Greek resistance, and there is also a British soldier uh, in the Battle of Crete. So everything is amalgamated. Uh, however, there is a more complicated narrative that is closer uh, to reality, which is uh, that those causes and effects are much more complex and related to each other in a much more complex and I think fascinating way. The story here goes uh, starts as a revolution in ideas in which various cosmopolitan, uh, commercial, and other elites, uh, Greek-speaking elites of the Ottoman Empire, develop a nationalist ideology as a result of that, plan an uprising uh, as a result of those ideas, connect with local elites on the ground, which leads to the Greek War of Independence, and creates, in a way, uh, the modern Greek nation uh, and that narrative. Uh, is, in a sense, a story about how the Greek nation is as much the creation of this process is born through the Greek revolution as it is the process and the agent that leads uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this result. I'm going to conclude by moving to the third uh, bundle uh, of reasons why today we should um, be uh, looking at the Greek revolution uh, with a lot of interest. And this is because the story itself is a fascinating story. And I was reminded of that uh, by uh, precisely reason number one, which is the bicentennial. I read a lot because uh, it was the thing to do uh, this year. I reflected a lot and I learned a lot. And it's a fascinating story with endless um, layers uh, that we think we know and, and very often come to new light when we look at them uh, in a more uh, uh, careful uh, and focused way. So I'm going to mention a number of aspects. I'm going to, to discuss the idea of um, the, uh, an uprising against all odds, uh, the idea of winning by not losing, the idea of marketing, uh, the idea of influencers, and the idea uh, and the um, process of being, uh, in a sense, lost and, and confused in translation. Um, these are ways to describe those very interesting, uh, and I'm sorry about humanitarian intervention, just forgot to remove it. Uh, one of those interesting aspects of um, uh, the story of the Greek War of Independence. So uh, it's a story, first of all, uh, uh, of a plan that is designed and launched with uh, almost zero probability of success. It's a crazy idea. Uh, when it designed. The design and the plan of the Greek Revolution uh, bears very little resemblance to its reality, and yet uh, it's, it's, a, it's a plan that eventually comes to fruition, not as imagined, uh, not uh, as easily perhaps, uh, but it comes to fruition. Um, and that, uh, I think, is a very inspiring uh, story of um, unintended consequences uh, of how launching 
uh, a plan very often uh, produces its realizations through pathways uh, that nobody quite imagined. Um, and um, it's very interesting to look uh, at the original plans that the uh, friendly society, which is the secret society that uh, conspired to organize the uprising, uh, had in mind. They, uh, for example, anticipated uh, a sort of uh, revolt uh, in Constantinople in which sailors from Greek ships would actually um, attack uh, the Sultan's palace, uh, abduct and kill him. Um, and the ideas that were very, very far removed from reality, including uh, the initial plan, uh, the, uh, the, the first move of, of the uprising in February of 1821, which was uh, an invasion and land invasion of the Ottoman Empire uh, in what today is uh, Moldavia from Russia, which uh, uh, didn't succeed. But uh, the process of organizing uh, this crazy plan is what led to its success through the creation of a unique uh, network of individuals who had not been connected together before and came to be connected together through precisely that plan. The second one is, uh, in a sense, the discovery uh, uh, of a very important dimension of uh, insurgency and civil war that uh, Mao Zedong, the famous Chinese revolutionary and statesman of the 20th century, came across, which is the idea that um, a lot of uh, wars of national liberation are in fact wars of attrition. It's something that sounds trivial and obvious, but wasn't. Uh, and the idea is here that uh, the point is not for rebels to succeed uh, by overpowering uh, the states uh, they rebel against because they're so much weaker than them, but by resisting imposing enough cost uh, uh, or bringing new actors into the game so that uh, the stronger states eventually have to compromise to sit uh, on a negotiating table and agree on an outcome uh, that is favorable to the rebels. And so this idea uh, of uh, resilience, uh, which we're going to encounter again and again uh, in the course of modern Greek history, is a part uh, of the narrative of uh, the creation of, of the modern Greek state that I think uh, sometimes is forgotten, but is absolutely essential for understanding how that process operated. The third one is selling your idea, your project, your plan to an international audience, what I call marketing. And the Greeks were extremely good at that, but it was not something that was easy. And the reason was because there were competing ideas and uh, the Greeks themselves did not always agree on which one was or ought to be the dominant one. Uh, the um, initially dominant idea was the idea of liberalism, which is what, uh, in a sense, um, animated uh, the friendly society. A lot of the early uh, Greek revolutionaries, especially uh, the historical figure of, of, of Rigas, Velestilis, uh, and this is the idea of liberalism, the set of ideas that emerged uh, in Europe um, and uh, North America uh, at the end of uh, the 19th century, the beginning the, of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century that gave rise to the French Revolution. Uh, and these were the ideas that almost buried uh, the fate of the Greek Revolution initially because it was perceived as a liberal revolution and therefore dangerous for the uh, status quo uh, of Europe post Napoleonic order. The second set of ideas has to do with Christianity. We very often forget um, that uh, what differentiated or what made Greeks was not so much language uh, as it was religion. Uh, and the, uh, the rebellion against the Ottoman Empire had a very strong religious dimension. The cross is, in fact, the national symbol of the Greek War of Independence and the Greek state after that. And it was, in fact, um, the idea that Christians were slaughtered by Muslims that mobilized uh, a lot of public opinion in Western Europe uh, governments and uh, uh, provided a, a very big uh, input uh, in mobilizing uh, the great powers uh, to intervene uh, and to justify their intervention. And, and the third one, of course, has to do with something completely different, and this is the idea of antiquity uh, through uh, the power uh, of the Greek past to, uh, in a sense, fire the imaginations uh, of European and American, uh, North American publics uh, by, in a sense, sending the message uh, that antiquity was coming back in a way that the descendants of ancient Greeks uh, were again making a claim to exist as an independent nation. Um, and I think a, a very interesting 
uh, way to think about that is to look at the figure of the military leader of the Greek Corps of Independence, Theodoros Kolokotronis. Uh, this is um, a, a faithful depiction of how he looked like uh, during uh, those years. He looks like a traditional fighter uh, of the Peloponnese. He was, in fact, bef before becoming a fighter of the Greek independence, a mercenary soldier, uh, and before that, what we would describe today and what was described then as a bandit. Uh, but his famous portrait since uh, is different, is the one in, uh, where he wears uh, a helmet that um, brings back the idea uh, of ancient Greece. Uh, and also on, uh, very prominently on, on his helmet, you can see the cross. So it's an amalgamation of those ideas. And that shows you how uh, a battle, the battle of ideas marketing uh, internationally is essential for these kinds of processes and remains so. We're moving to the third uh, type, the influencers, uh, the people who, whose role is um, essential uh, for spreading those ideas, popularizing um, a cause uh, and making uh, uh, sure that this cause receives the sort of attention uh, that its proponents believe it deserves. And of course, Lord Byron is a fundamental figure in that respect. It's very difficult to understate his importance uh, during that time and, and how his death really uh, played a very big role in publicizing the Greek cause. Uh, and the only uh, person I can think of in the modern times who has had a similar role for a number of different cause, causes is of course um, the well-known singer Bono. So the Greeks were very lucky to have such an ally who was a global influencer uh, of his time. Uh, but of course, um, uh, that creates a problem that very often um, can be described as being lost in translation. That is, uh, when you um, combine all these different actors with very different agendas and perceptions, when you yourself, as, as the key agent of that process, uh, are conflicted in terms of what ideas motivate you, then um, I think uh, you create confusion and confusion very often creates misunderstanding. Um, I'll show you a couple of examples. This is a depiction of Theodorus Kolokotronis in a, in a popular um, lithograph uh, uh, that circulated in Germany that depicts him as a sort of European prince. Uh, and that must have uh, captured the imagination of a lot of Germans, some of whom may have traveled to Greece to fight on the Greek side. And of course, were very surprised uh, that the real Kolokotronis and the real Greeks didn't resemble that kind of picture. Uh, another picture is the way in which a famous fighter, um, Odysseus Androutsos, is depicted. You can see uh, a very romantic type of depiction in which he looks like a slightly exotic, but very much Western looking uh, prince. And I'm going to show you his actual likeness uh, next. Uh, he looks very different. And of course, people expecting a and encounter B sometimes feel cheated and that creates resentment and reaction. Um, we could say a lot about that, but I think uh, I've tried to make the case using just a few among many other examples for why the Greek revolution is not just an event that matters uh, for Greeks as uh, it is the 200th anniversary uh, of its eruption is not just something that should occupy the minds of professional historians and other scholars because it allows us to see uh, a number of uh, global and other processes uh, and, and give uh, a very different light uh, to them. But it's also uh, a story that in and of itself is absolutely fascinating uh, and contains uh, many more uh, fascinating aspects than the ones that I, I uh, suggested today. And so it's a source of endless discovery um, and deserves therefore uh, to be read and thought about. So uh, with that note, I will thank you very much for your attention uh, and I hope to meet you in person uh, in uh, some time in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, let me see if I can just... Uh -huh. uh, well, I asked Professor Calavas to address this, um, as he calls it, fascinating story 
with endless layers in just 15 minutes. I thought that was a preposterous challenge, but worth, uh, worth attempting. Uh, I can't think of a better uh, way of spending 15 minutes as a brilliant snapshot, a brilliant introduction uh, to why the revolution matters. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Um, uh, I, I promised uh, you and the other speakers that I wouldn't um, uh, discourse uh, on the subject greatly at this point. I'll have the opportunity to come back at the end to, to thank you properly, but uh, uh, that was uh, everything I hoped it would be, and I'm sure the audience uh, thoroughly enjoyed it too. So uh, many thanks for that. It's now um, my um, uh, opportunity to turn to the Runciman Award itself. Uh, this year, and I'm not going to take too many words away from uh, the chair of uh, the panel, but this year uh, we increased the panel of judges to five, uh, trying to ensure that there, were, uh, there was always um, uh, some group in a majority uh, if we needed to, uh, to act in that way. And so this year we welcomed Sofka Zinoviev to the panel for the first time. In addition, four old hands, if I can call uh, them that, with uh, a lot of respect, uh, five old, four older hands returned, uh, Judith Mossman, uh, Dionysius Capsalis, uh, Nisha McSweeney and Peter Frankopan. I'm grateful to all five judges. Um, they're not uh, paid for uh, this tough work um, and they did so with great uh, enthusiasm and fantastic uh, expertise. This year's chair uh, is Peter Frankopan the author of Silk Roads uh, and New Silk Roads, well-received books on Byzantium and the Crusades. He uh, needs absolutely no introduction from me. And he's here uh, both to tell us about this year's competition, as seen from the uh, judges' seats, uh, and to announce the winner. Peter, over to you. Uh, thank you, John. Well, let me start also by thanking uh, Professor Calivas. That was, that was uh, absolutely terrific. Um, luckily, uh, as as John told you at the beginning, uh, it's this is the uh, it's in three acts, and the middle act is always the least interesting and uh, the slowest one. So uh, I'll try and get through. But um, huge thanks for inviting me to um, to talk to you this evening on behalf of the judges. I'm so sorry that we're not um, all present and be able to share a glass of wine and to catch up with old friends. But I can see in the participant list many friends. Uh, some from the very distant past um, who traveled along with me for the last 30 years or more. So um, welcome all of you and lovely to see everybody here. Um, as John said, um, being on a jury, it's, it, it requires the generosity and eloquence of, of many people, particularly the, the other members of the jury. So uh, Sofka Zinoviev, Dionysis Kapsalis, Nisha McSweeney and Judith Mossman have, have made this a real, a real pleasure uh, to be part of a committee like this. It's terrible having to choose between outstanding books, uh, but we we did so while remaining friends and laughing the whole way through. So I'm very grateful to each of them for the time they put into um, reading the books and thinking about them and then discussing them in, in a way that was both collegiate, convivial, and I think very stimulating too. So thank you all, all for that. I'm hugely grateful to the Anglo-Hellenic League for the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes making this happen. Uh, no drinks to arrange this year, but I know how much uh, goes on in the background. I'm very grateful to John Kitmer in particular for the support he's given me as the chair and to all the jurors uh, and to just the, you know getting books into the right place is not easy um, in a Brexit world and in the Covid world so even getting books to Greece uh, many of you will know is not as easy as it could or should or perhaps might have been had things gone in a slightly different direction but anyway um, I'm very grateful this wouldn't have been able to happen otherwise. Um, so I'll say just a few words about this this year's books. I, I'm keen not to hold anybody up, um, but this has been a very difficult 18 months for everybody around the world. But one of the um, silver linings, I suppose, is that book reading um, has, has really accelerated over the course of the pandemic. People with nothing to do, no one to see, have been stuck at home reading books. And we've been very lucky to, uh, re to read books that were all written before the pandemic struck. Um, I suspect future years will be even richer still, but we had a, a year of glory to consider. We had books about uh, Greek experiences of India, looking at other parts of the world, how Greece's imprint is not just in one corner of the Eastern Mediterranean or necessarily westwards. I personally welcome that too. We had uh, books about Herodotus, about Socrates, about some of the greats, the greats and the goods uh, from, the, from the Greek past. 
um, editions of text, retellings of well-known stories and not so well-known stories. And it's been a pleasure to read them. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, Greek history is very heavily weighted still towards antiquity. There are some obvious and good reasons for that. Uh, but it's great to be seeing some push at the boundaries into the modern world, as well as regionally taking us, as I mentioned, into slightly different geographies. I, I wish that there will be more, and I hope there'll be more of those um, in the future. But the caliber of the books that submitted in their own fields was absolutely fantastic. And it was very difficult in the first instance to narrow down to a long list. We tried as a jury, I think, to curate a long list that recognized excellence across uh, different fields and different disciplines and to reward uh, bravery as well as excellence. Uh, some of these topics are not easy to write about. And I think one thing that a jury can do is to recognize uh, topics, methodologies uh, that are perhaps uh, more complex and deserve to be uh, to be praised. And that bravery is something I think that runs through each of the seven who are on our long list this year. Uh, in some cases, dealing with old stories might even be seen as, as heretical. Uh, and I'm sure that some would say that about Stephen Fry's Troy, how can one beat Homer? Uh, but uh, Stephen Fry gave Homer a good run for his money. And it's so important, I think, to be bringing stories from the past through new voices to reach new media. One of the, one of the key elements of the Runciman Prize is to be thinking about how general audiences engage with the Hellenic world. And Stephen Fry has been a fantastic ambassador on that level, a truly really ingenious um, engagement with, um, with, with Homer, and I think greatly appreciated by us as judges. Bethany Hughes is Venus and Aphrodite. Bethany Hughes, many of you will know well, is a fantastic ambassador for classics generally, such an eloquent um, and generous scholar and uh, such a fantastic communicator. Um, this is a book that takes us through the agony and the ecstasy and the history of a goddess from a perspective, not just of classics, but of gender, we delighted in seeing on our long list. Uh, Karen Nivali, her book, The Moon and in Greek and Roman Imagination uh, is extraordinarily original. Uh, it's imperious even in unlocking, well, maybe not a new world exactly, but a, mu a moon that I had never given any thought to and doing so in a way that is completely engaging um, and wonderful, thinking about how um, ancient Greeks and Romans thought about the moon in terms of what it was made of, what it represented, how they projected ideas onto it. Um, it's a work of breathtaking originality. Um, Roderick Beaton's Greece, a uh, biography of a modern nation, uh, takes us more or less from where um, Statis was talking us through, from, more or less from um, Greek independence through to the modern day. Uh, although as a Byzantinist, always nice to see that the past few centuries weren't ignored too. Um, but this missing link, I think, is important for, uh, for Greece and its uh, burnished reputation abroad. Um, classics faculties are fantastically strong in the UK and in many parts of Europe, although there's pressure on those as there is on much of the humanities. But I do think it's incredibly important to be having accessible books that provide general perspectives over what Greece is and has been over the last centuries and in the present day, um, as well as in that classical past. Um, as Beaton begins the book, he says, many people ask who were the Greeks, but maybe we should be asking who are the Greeks? Uh, it's a very brave book. It steps on minefields. And many people I know have strong opinions about what should and shouldn't be included in a history like this or how it's written, uh, but we enjoyed the breadth, the ambition and the execution um, by Roderick Beaton. Uh, the fifth book was Michaelis Ganas, one of Greece's most loved, best known poets, um, very personal set of poems, expertly translated by David Connolly and Joshua, ba Joshua Barley uh, in collaboration with the poet. And I think we all recognized the beauty of the originals, but also the wonder of the translated poems, which is a craft in its own right. Um, these are stories that talk about personal longing, of love, of hope, that draw on folklore, that draw on history, that draw on personal experiences, uh, and gives a real window into Greece of the past, present, and maybe even the future too. The sixth book, Dimitar Angelov, a very distinguished Byzantinist, now based at Harvard, a brilliant book, uh, The Byzantine Hellene, The Life of the Emperor Theodore Lascaris, um, one of the great emperors of the Byzantine period, and one of the certainly one of the cleverest. Um, as Dimitar reminds us at the beginning of the book, uh, Lascaris says he his his in a letter written just before he died, uh, he was always thinking about how he'd be judged by future generations. And Engelhoff has done a, a fantastic work in bringing to life 
um, not just uh, an individual, but a world around him and an empire in transition based in Nicaea in the 13th century. And it's wonderful to see books like this being published uh, by university presses at affordable prices, uh, making uh, the Byzantine world live and breathe in the way that it, it, it does. And then the final book on our list uh, by Gondor Van Steen, an extremely distinguished professor, Corres Professor at King's um, on adoption memory in Cold War Greece, a quid pro quo, um, extraordinarily gathered a series of um, materials from personal interviews, from letters, from archives, um, the, the real nuts and bolts of what it means to be a first class historian, um, telling the story of Greek adoptions into the United States, uh, which when I started reading it, I thought would be niche, but actually it tells a story that's so profoundly important, uh, not just about Greece and about the United States, but about ideas about the family and the ideas about how we function as a human society. It's moving, um, but it's also a first class work of, of history, hugely enjoyable to read, although traumatic as well in telling the story of Greece in the post -cold, in the post war era. Uh, it's impossible, it was almost impossible. Well, it is impossible to choose between books like this. I think it's fair to say that each of these um, would have won a prize if the rubric of a, uh, of a competition was set up for their category. Each one is a work that will be read in, um, in many years to come. And that's a real testament to their authors and of course uh, to their publishers. Uh, John Kitmer is, is too modest to say that he, one of the things he does so well is to make sure that publishers realize that if books are going to be entered and have a chance of winning a prize like this, aiming at general readers as well as scholars, they do need to be produced at affordable prices. And um, speaking, I think on behalf of academic publications, some of us find it very hard to understand sometimes why cover prices of books that are so good as this are put out of the range, range of normal buyers. Um, as it happens through John's interventions, we've had some very successful um, movement, I think, on some of these areas. And I think all of those on this call and those of you who both write or read books, uh, I think it's important to, to say how much you enjoy reading them uh, in the hope that more and more people can, um, can have access to these books in the future. Uh, as I said, each one of these books is a, it would, would win a prize. Uh, we, were, we were reminded, and I reminded the jury uh, regularly about Sir Stephen Runciman, after whom this prize is named, and, and how the thing that I suppose Runciman did that was most important was to open doors that other scholars have walked through. Um, many of my less generous colleagues will point out Runciman's flaws, his weaknesses, uh, his lack of dealing with the sources in a way that perhaps in 2021 we would handle them. But I think that ability to uh, open up new perspectives is one that is really hard to do and it's really hard to do well and hard to do with generosity. So I think we as a, as a committee try to think about which of these books would encourage more work to be done, which would shine lights into areas that perhaps needed some more light shone into them. And as I mentioned, uh, each of these could do that. But after considerable discussion, a lot of um, heartfelt conversations, no tears uh, and no major disagreements, but talking things through so that we all reach the conclusion together. I'm delighted to announce that the winner of this year's Ransomin Award administered by the Anglo-Hellenic League is uh, Roderick Beaton's Greece Biography of a Modern Nation. So hopefully Roddy, you're here and now over to you. Peter, what can I say? Um, I am overcome and uh, thank you for your, your kind words, your judgment, uh, the, uh, uh, the wise input of the, your fellow judges that you spoke to us about. And can I take this opportunity also to uh, thank most warmly John Kitmer and all the wonderful things that I too have a pretty good idea uh, must go on behind the scenes in the Anglo-Hellenic League to make this possible. Um, and also, um, it was a marvellous occasion uh, this evening. I loved the presentation that Stathis gave us earlier on the subject that could not be more appropriate to the um, <clears throat> 200th anniversary of the Greek Revolution. Um, and as, as it happens, um, he and I have a great deal in common in the way that we approach uh, the subject that is dear to us both, namely the recent history of Greece. To win the Runciman Award has to be the ultimate accolade for anyone who loves writing about Greece and the Greek world. There are lots of literary prizes out there, and an even larger number of 
great books out there chasing them. But there's something very special about the Ransom. It commemorates, as Peter told us, an academic and polymath who perfected the art of wearing his learning lightly and in communicating it with an elegance that still stands the test of time. But not just that, Stephen Runciman's interests, which were very wide, were rooted not so much actually in Greece, but in the wider world of what in Greek is called Hellenism, by which is meant the Greek people, their history, their culture, wherever in the world these may be found. To win the Runciman once may therefore be considered the greatest good fortune for a Hellenist. To win it, and I have to confess this, well, more than once, in the words of Oscar Wilde, looks like carelessness. Here, I can only blame the judges, who must have known what they were about, and that this particular contender has been here before, I confess. Let me, however, thank them from the bottom of my heart for their carelessness. The honour is all the greater this time because, as you've just heard, a bumper crop of books published over two whole years came before their scrutiny this time. It was already a great honour to be listed among the 21 titles in this anniversary year, get it, 2021, in an impressively heavyweight long list. It must have been a hard task to whittle down those 21 to the seven that made it onto the short list. And when that list duly came out, I was thrilled to find myself in such distinguished company. So allow me please now to extend my warmest congratulations to all the authors and the translators that you just heard about with whom I'm most proud to rub shoulders on this year's Ransom and Shortlist. Judges, I don't know how you managed to pick a winner and I'm immensely grateful that your choice has fallen on my book. But beyond the excitement of the chase and the um, suspense generated by the competition, there is surely a bigger and a more important picture. And Peter alluded this, to this too. And that surely is the strength of the field. There can never have been so many different kinds of books produced in English about Greece and the Hellenic world with such an array of different interests and powerful talents on display as in this anniversary year of the Greek Revolution of 1821. So I'm deeply proud to be one among them. Now, I'm not going to let you go quite that easily. So if you'll bear with me, while we're all in this virtual Zoom room together, and before your patience wears out, let me tell you a few things about how I came to write Greece, Biography of a Modern Nation. I'd actually never written a history book before. And if you ask me for my qualifications formally, I'm not even qualified to write one. But I had written a biography. I wrote the biography of the poet and diplomat, George Seferis. My previous book before this one, about Lord Byron and Greece, was in many ways a biography too, though of course, not a complete one. It's not just that the genre attracts me, I read a lot of biographies, and it still does, but both those subjects, Severus and Byron, brought the literary scholar, which is what I am by training and profession, ever more to confront the world of politics and events of which Stathis was speaking earlier, the domain of the historian. Indeed, it can't be accidental, though I don't think I saw it coming, that both of my chosen biographies were literary figures who became also deeply implicated in the making of history. So perhaps it wasn't such a great leap after all. From Seferis, whose work and life were inextricably intertwined with the history of his country during the middle decades of the 20th century, and Byron, who with his involvement in the Greek Revolution was in there at the beginning, to try to conjure up the biography of Greece itself in the modern era. Now, of course, the book isn't literally a biography. The title draws an analogy. And like all analogies, this one only takes you so far. 
but I will share with you the fact that it was fun devising chapter titles and structuring a narrative in such a way as to correspond to the life cycle of an individual, from genealogical tree, ancestors distant and less distant, to conception and birth, then through the stages of growth from infanthood to what I risked calling in the last chapter, and with a teasing question mark, a midlife crisis. As I wrote in the introduction, the story obviously doesn't stop with the end of the narrative. And indeed, <clears throat> quite a lot has happened to the modern nation that is Greece since the latest update that I was able to introduce into the paperback edition, which appeared in March last year. The PRESPA agreement on the naming of Greece's northern neighbour, North Macedonia, just scraped in, but not the ratification of that agreement by the parliaments of both countries early in 2019, and not the election that brought the present Greek government to power in July the same year. I think now that the chapter on the midlife crisis probably ends shortly after that election with what seems to have been the final easing of that <clears throat> financial crisis. The new challenges facing the Mitsotakis government, not least among them the COVID pandemic, look now like the start of a new chapter. And who knows where that one will lead? You can't write history or biography <clears throat> until after it's happened. I called it the biography of a nation for two reasons. First, I didn't want to write another history of the Greek state because there are several excellent histories already in circulation in English. And it's just as well, because how was I to know that this very evening I would be preceded by the author of this truly excellent modern Greece, what everyone needs to know, from which if you read the rather extensive notes at the back of my own book, you will see that I learned much and found much that indeed I agreed with. A nation is far harder to define than a state. A nation is inseparable as an idea from the state that embodies it, but it's never identical with it either. A nation is all about identity. A nation is defined by who we think we are, at least as much as by the laws and the frontiers and the colour of passport that also, in a more mundane sense, define us. Focusing on the nation meant that I could give more attention than is common in many history books <clears throat> to um, what is might broadly be called arts and culture. I wanted the reader to be able to eavesdrop, as it were, on how the subject thinks and feels, not just on what that subject says and does. So poetry, fiction, visual arts, music, both popular and traditional, film, naturally, all of these had to have a place. The second reason for choosing the nation as my focus is that nations at least according to an enormous and influential body of contemporary scholarship, are a creation of the modern world. The ideas on which nations are founded were established during the European Enlightenment of the 18th century, most prominently perhaps by the Swiss Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the German Johann Gottfried Herder. This, I know very well, is contested territory. The deliberately narrow definition of a nation that I chose to adopt, as I explained in my introduction, is not the only one available. On the contrary, since the middle of the 19th century, which was of course the heyday of nationalism throughout Europe, Greeks have been accustomed to trace the history of their own nation from the very earliest records of the Greek language, through the civilization that we still call classical, through the Byzantine millennium and the interval of Ottoman rule, up to the culmination in the creation and development of the nation state in the 1820s and the 1830s, of which Stathi spoke so eloquently before. Now, I've no quarrel with that story, far from it. Indeed, I've been doing my best to retell it for the benefit of a non-Greek readership not brought up on that way of telling the story in my new book, which will be published later this year. 
But the story of Greece as a modern nation, by which I mean as a nation created in the image of the ideas of the European and yes, also the Greek enlightenment, can only be a story of modern times. And the achievement that I wanted to stress in writing this book is the astonishing success of the Greeks by feats of arms and also of persuasion, first in winning and then in maintaining the independence of their nation state, which indeed is why, as we heard, the Greek war of independence or revolution of 200 years ago really does still matter today. Greece was the first such state to be recognized on the European continent after the Napoleonic Wars. And that, let me just insist on this a little bit, was the achievement of modern Greeks in modern times, not the achievement of their long dead ancestors, however glorious, long ago. It's a well-known fact that the ancient Greeks, for all their genius in so many spheres, never succeeded in creating a unified political state based on the Greek language, on the Greek customs and common laws. That was left for the moderns to achieve. And in doing so, in the 1820s and the 1830s, those modern Greeks also happened to lay the foundations for the Europe of nation states that we know and live with today. My book is meant to record that and many other achievements of Greeks in modern times, along with the tragedies and some of the human suffering that have all too often accompanied them along the way. I wouldn't claim that calling it a biography necessarily changes our understanding of events and their causes, but Stephen Runciman was not only a great historian, he knew how to tell a good story. And I hope more modestly to have told the story of Greece as a modern nation in a way that readers will enjoy. In that way, I'd like to think more people who may know or care little about the subject may be drawn to learn about Greece and the Hellenic world, the very subject, surely, that brings all of us here together this evening. It's a real privilege to be with you, to be giving this short talk. Now, I really had not imagined that such a thing would happen. Um, here we are in this rather strange cyberspace. Let me raise a glass metaphorically to you all and to thank the judges and the Anglo-Hellenic League one most warmly once again. Yamas Sasafkaristo Getina Croasi. Thank you for listening. Roddy, my uh, my glass is empty, but if it were full, I would raise it to you. Thank you for uh, speaking so uh, persuasively and clearly summarizing uh, your fantastic book. Let me uh, add my own uh, congratulations to those of Peter for this uh, record-breaking win. You have been uh, very modest in uh, your acceptance speech, um, but to be clear to for all the benefit of all of the audience, um, you are now, uh, you were the only person ever to have won the Ron Simon Award three times, and now uh, you are the only person to have won the Ron Simon Award four times. If there were, which there isn't, a Runciman Cup. I fear I would be now giving it to you permanently and commissioning a new design for next year's award. Luckily, I'm in the easier position of uh, posting to you tomorrow morning a certificate uh, in the post uh, and arranging uh, the transfer, uh, thanks to our sponsor's generosity, of uh, the prize uh, money. This is, uh, it is a fantastic book and uh, a great choice uh, by the jury in this uh, year where we're all celebrating uh, the bicentenary, the liberation of the Greek people, the foundation of the modern state. Um, so my own congratulations are really heartfelt. I think it's a, a fantastic winner in what was, as Peter and you yourself have said, a truly, truly fantastic field this year. Now, um, I have lots of people to thank, but I am going to do it in a, a concise and disciplined way. Um, this sort of event does rest on the hard work of uh, many people. Let me particularly thank uh, Peter Frankopan and all of the judges, Nisha, Judith, Dionysis, and Sofka. You have been a great and very collegiate group. 
Um, we had COVID and Brexit to work a way around, but uh, thanks to your flexibility and uh, quite a few encounters with Greek customs for our two Greek judges, uh, we got there, we got books to you, uh, you read them very diligently. Uh, as the administrator this year of the award, uh, I had the pleasure of listening to your conversations and really, uh, really enjoyed it. I am delighted that you are all going to return uh, next year to constitute the judging panel for Runciman 2022. We shall be launching the call to publishers uh, at the end of October uh, in the usual way. From what I see and from what I read of the new books coming out uh, this year, the competition next year is also going to be very interesting and I guess pretty tough to find, uh, to find the winner. Let me uh, again warmly thank our speaker tonight, our guest speaker tonight, Stathis Kalivas. Um, in 15 minutes, he gave us uh, a tremendously rich, creative and stimulating talk that will certainly, I am sure, encourage us uh, to keep reading uh, about this multi-layered story and to keep listening to events like this. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for uh, a fantastic talk. I want to repeat, not least because I uh, made a mistake at the start and forgot to uh, start the recording until I had finished my introductory words, but I want to repeat for uh, the recording's purpose and uh, its good manners anyway, my uh, heartfelt gratitude to the sponsors, to the Lascaridis and Levendis Foundations uh, for taking up the baton and providing uh, not only um, the prize money and the administrative funds, but also a great deal of moral support and encouragement for all of us working on this prize. We really do uh, appreciate the ease of the way uh, in which you allow us to work with you. So uh, many thanks to, to all of the teams uh, in, both, uh, in both foundations with whom uh, we're working. Our websites, media and social media this year have involved a small team of volunteers. Um, let me thank Isabel Clark and Rula Konzotis for their hard work. We've been really grateful to enjoy the advice and active support of Dimitris Kraniotis from Arc for Art. Many thanks to him. Uh, also thanks to Paul Watkins and to our treasurer John Karras for their contributions to uh, tonight's proceedings. Unusually, this year, the administration of the award has fallen to me, the, the chair of the league. This has been fun for me, but isn't usually uh, the task of the chair. Um, we are searching for a new Runciman administrator. Like all charity trusteeships, this is an unpaid role, but it's an exciting and a manageable role for anyone who loves books and Greece and has some basic administrative skills. If you think this might be something for you, uh, please do drop us a line. We have a job description which we can share with you. And let me show you, here we go. Let me move this on. So if you drop us a line um, to our info box, if you're interested, uh, I will share with you uh, the job description um, and chats to anybody who feels uh, they may be interested. No one uh, will be on their own. Uh, I plan a sort of twin control approach to running uh, Runciman in 2022. For the league itself, our next events take place this coming Monday. We are getting together at the Hellenic Centre in a socially distanced way for our annual general meeting and the annual Katie Lendarkis Memorial Award ceremony and lecture. Our lecturer this year is Professor Ruth Padell. Information about both events is available on our website. You must sign up in advance and let us know you're coming because of social distancing rules. Um, of course, we do hope that people will come. We already have an audience uh, for both, but there are there is still some space for some additional uh, additional names. Uh, again, please uh, drop us a line to the uh, to the info box. It is uh, great to be able to start gently. Uh, returning to events. Alas, we can't hold uh, a reception uh, after the Katie Lendakis um, award ceremony, but we can at least uh, say hello to people uh, with our masks uh, and standing and sitting the right distance apart from each other. Um, 
Don't forget also um, to keep following the 21 in 21 program uh, for UK events celebrating the bicentenary. It's very easily found uh, through a Google search, just put in 21 in 21. Uh, the program is really rich in the autumn. Um, there are some great events coming up, some in Edinburgh, some in London, some elsewhere. Please do uh, follow it uh, closely because uh, Stathis Kalevas has said to us, uh, this is a subject which really repays um, reading, learning, investigation. So uh, please look out for what's coming, coming our way. Let me close by just thanking you all very warmly. We've had a good uh, audience tonight. Um, uh, which has been appreciated. It's a shame that we can't uh, interact with you. Um, we really do hope in the autumn uh, that we'll have live uh, in the flesh events at the, Hel at the Hellenic Center without social restrictions. So we will keep our fingers crossed. In the meantime, on behalf of all of the council, I wish you a safe, healthy, relaxing summer. Thank you to everyone who has participated tonight. We're at an end. Kalo Kalo Keri. Good night.